Hi, my name is Lawrence. I want to welcome all of you to today's midweek teaching. If this is the first time you've joined us, thank you for joining us and welcome. Before we get into the teaching proper, can I encourage all of you to join us for a moment of worship to prepare our hearts for the word today that I believe is going to bless all of us. Come, let's worship our Lord Jesus. Shalom and God bless you all. Holy Spirit, we welcome you. Move in our church. Move in this place. Hallelujah. As the Spirit was moving over the water, Spirit, come move on us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. As the Spirit was moving over the water, Spirit, come move on Rest on us, come rest on us.
revival come upon our city. May revival come upon our nation. May revival come upon this world. Move again, Lord, as your people cry out to you. Come rest on us, Holy Spirit.
The spiritual realm, the world that is invisible and unseen to the naked eye, is as real as the natural, physical, visible, and seen world. In fact, what is in the spiritual is more real than what is in the natural world. What we see with our eyes today is temporary. It will all pass away. But everything that is in the spiritual is eternal, meaning it will last forever. And this is why the Bible talks about a second death. Our passing away from this world is simply an end to our mortal bodies, our house. But who we are, our spirit, our spirit goes on. So when the Bible talks about eternal life, it means there is also eternal death. When you became born again, it does not mean that you gained an extension of your existence. Rather, it means your existence after this temporary world will be an eternal existence in a state of life, meaning no sickness, no pain, no disease. The ones who are not born again in the spirit will still have a continued existence after this temporary world, but theirs will be an eternal existence in a state of death, non-stop burning in hellfire, non-stop suffering from all diseases and sicknesses, non-stop suffering from all the curses. I mean, aren't you glad Jesus came to redeem you from all of those? The physical world is temporary. The spiritual world is eternal. Now, we all have to understand that the spiritual world overlaps with the physical, natural world. And what happens in the spiritual affects the physical. A lot of things happening around us are effects of what has happened or what is happening in the spiritual world. The spiritual world is as active as the physical, natural world. There are spirits at work that we, we don't see with our naked eyes. But don't be afraid. The greatest, most powerful spirit there is lives and dwells in each of us, born-again children of God, permanently and forever. And he is greater than all other spirits around us, even greater than all the angels, which are spirits are around us too. The Holy Spirit is the great promise of all the great promises of the Father to us, his children. In Luke, after his resurrection, Jesus spoke of the Holy Spirit as the promise of my Father, who is power from on high. And then in the book of Acts, which is a continuation of Luke's account of the things Jesus began both to do and teach, it tells us that the promise of the Father is being baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now, we need to understand something important. There are two importations of the Holy Spirit in the born-again Christian's life. Uh, let me illustrate. After the resurrection of Jesus, he appeared to his disciples, right? We read in John chapter 20, it says, And when he, referring to Jesus, had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. This was the first impartation of the Holy Spirit to the disciples by the resurrected Jesus. And this was for the rebirth or being born again in the Spirit. Now, after the ascension of Jesus, specifically on the day of Pentecost, we read in the book of Acts in chapter 2, it says, And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, this filling with the Holy Spirit is not about being born again, because we just established that they experienced the rebirth in the Spirit in the upper room back in John chapter 20. What happened in Acts 2 is the receiving of the promise of the Father, which is the baptism of the Holy Spirit, an endowment of power from high. What happened uh, back in John 20 is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in a believer. In Acts 2, it is the start of the operation of the power of the Holy Spirit through the believer. Now, understand this. The Holy Spirit is in us for us. He's the seal that guarantees us that we belong to God. But the Holy Spirit on us and filling us after being born again is for others. He works through us for the people around us. This is what grace is about. The Lord gives, the Lord supplies and fills us for ourselves first and then so that he can fulfill things through us for others. Now, if any of you are wondering how long the baptism of the Holy Spirit happens after being born again, let me just say one thing. Unlike the disciples who lived through the days between the resurrection of Jesus and the ascension of Jesus, you and I are in a better position today to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit immediately after being born again, or even so simultaneously as we get born again. Because friends, we are living after both the resurrection and ascension of Jesus. So, 
If there's someone watching right now who have not been born again, you can actually be born again right now and receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit at the same time. In fact, we find this happening in Acts 10 where Peter was still preaching to the Gentiles, to Cornelius and his household, and immediately the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out on them. And we don't even find them praying a salvation prayer. And it even happened before they were water baptized. So God is not legalistic. He's not bound in religion. Let me show you what happened in Acts 10. So this is in Acts 10 verses 44 to 48. It says, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. This talks about the finished work of Jesus resulting to remission of sins being preached. And you can find the details of uh, the preaching of Peter in the previous verses. Then the next verse goes, goes on to say, And those of the circumcision who believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. This points to the baptism of the Holy Spirit happening. For they heard... For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then Peter answered. Now, here we read that the baptism of the Holy Spirit resulted to them speaking in tongues and magnifying God, much like how it happened to the disciples in Acts chapter 2. Peter says, Can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then they asked him to stay a few days. This talks about them, Cornelius and his household, getting water baptized. Do you see it? Like I said, today anyone who believes, accepts, and receives Jesus and his finished work, you can get born again and receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit at the same time, because both resurrection and ascension have already happened. Ever since the ascension of Jesus, especially on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit has been actively working. The Holy Spirit is the most active part of the triune God in this present world today. So it is to our benefit to get to know Him. And there's so many things we can get to know about the Holy Spirit, but I believe the primary thing that we need to know about Him is His heart and His ministry. So let's talk about that. Uh... But before I get to that, let me first establish what the Holy Spirit is not. Now, I mentioned earlier that the spiritual realm is as active as the physical natural world. Always remember that the spirits that come from the enemy are always against you. They hate you. But that the Holy Spirit is for you. The most powerful spirit is for you. In the battle between good and bad, the Holy Spirit is always on your side. He will actively fight for you. If you let him. Please understand that the Holy Spirit is one with the Father and the Son, which means if the Father and the Son do not force favor and blessings on you, so will the Holy Spirit not force anything on you. He is as much a gentleman as the Father and Jesus are. If you don't employ the Holy Spirit, he will not force you to take advantage of his power and might. Now, if we study the Bible carefully, we get a glimpse of some of the spirits out there and what their specialties are. In the Gospel of Luke, it tells us about the spirit of an unclean demon. In the Gospel, uh, in the same Gospel, it also talks about a spirit of infirmity that kept a woman bowed down. In the Book of Acts, there is a mention of a spirit of divination. With this, we know there are different spirits out there that are not from God. In the Old Testament, there are mentions of what the Bible calls familiar spirits. The very first time familiar spirits are mentioned are in the book of Leviticus. Now let me read to you the verses from Leviticus that speak about these familiar spirits. Leviticus 19.31, it says, Give no regard to mediums and familiar spirits. Do not seek after them to be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. Leviticus 20 verse 6, And the person who turns to mediums and familiar spirits to prostitute himself with them, I will set my face against that person and cut him off from his people. Leviticus 20 verse 27, A man or a woman who is a medium or has familiar spirits shall surely be put to death. They shall stone them with stones. Their blood shall be upon them. Now let me put all three up in here. If you notice... These verses tell us very clearly that we are not to have anything to do with mediums and familiar spirits because they defile us. Now, if you study the original text in here, we find that mediums and familiar spirits always go together. Now, let me pause in here and provide a, uh, just a bit of background on the outline of the book of Leviticus. There are five major sections in 
um, in Leviticus. Uh, the description of the sacrificial system from chapter 1 to chapter 7, and then we have the service of the priests in the sanctuary from chapter 8 to 10, the laws of impurities from chapter 11 to chapter 16, the holiness code from chapter 17 to 26, and then we have the gifts of, to the sanctuary from chapter uh, the entire chapter chapter 27. Okay, so the three verses we just read now that talks about familiar spirits, they belong in the holiness code section. Now remember, in the Gospels, how when Jesus walked the earth, he brought the law to heaven standards, to its most pristine standards. Now please, uh, please do not misunderstand the law to only mean as the Ten Commandments. The law covers much more than the Ten Commandments. The law covers all commands and statutes and instructions written in the five books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. In fact, the Jews have 613 laws outlined from the book books of Moses. That is the complete law, not just the Ten Commandments. So when Jesus likened getting angry with, his, with, with a brother without a cause as murder and said that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart, Jesus is teaching us that the standards of the law, the entire law, is not met in the outward display of behavior. Jesus is teaching us that there's much more to the requirements of the law than just doing the physical act. Jesus is teaching it. Uh, that, that you don't have to stab someone to commit murder, but that hating without a cause is murder. Jesus is teaching that you don't have to have actual sexual intercourse with someone who is not your husband or wife, but that lusting after someone who is not your husband or wife is in fact adultery in heaven's standards. So keeping what Jesus taught about the standards of the law, we understand that these instructions to never have anything to do with mediums and familiar spirits have much more to this. And keeping what Jesus taught about heaven's standards of the law, we understand that these commands are not only fulfilled by not going to a medium or someone who practices calling up the dead. There is more to this. Now, to better understand what going to a medium and familiar spirits look like, especially in the New Covenant, let's first talk about the account of King Saul. At the time when he had already been rejected by God and David had already been anointed king, but is currently on the run from Saul, who is obsessed at killing David. And also at that time, the prophet Samuel had died. 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 3. Now Samuel had died, and all Israel had lamented for him and buried him in Ramah, in his own city. And Saul had put the mediums and the spiritists out of the land. So Saul did well in this, that he put out the mediums and spiritists out of the land. We just read three commandment verses from Leviticus, right? Clearly saying to have nothing to do with mediums and familiar spirits. So Saul did well. From here we read that the Philistines gathered together to come against Israel. Saul then inquired of the Lord, but the Lord did not answer him, not by dreams, nor by Urim, nor by the prophets. You know, the problem was that in the Old Testament, there is always a mediator between God, man and God, either a prophet or a priest, but Samuel, the prophet, has just died. So whoever the prophets that Saul went to were not prophets ordained by the Lord to speak to, to, to Saul. And six chapters prior to this, in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 22, Saul had killed the priests at Nob, except for Abiathar, who escaped with a linen ephod. And in the Old Testament, do you know that it is by the ephod and through a priest can one inquire of the Lord? So pretty much Saul had lost all means to get guidance from the Lord. No prophet, no linen ephod administered by a priest. See, we often fail to realize how blessed we are that in the new covenant, in, in, in the covenant we now live in, we have direct access to God. We even have the Holy Spirit himself dwelling in us. Unlike in the Old Testament where the Spirit of the Lord just comes on a person and goes, in the new covenant, God himself bound himself to a covenant saying, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And he places his very own spirit in everyone who receives his son Jesus and gets into a covenant with him through his son. I mean, praise God for Jesus, because if not for Jesus, all of us would be in a predicament like Saul, where we find ourselves abandoned. Praise God for Jesus, who made it possible for us to be in an eternal covenant, an eternal communion and fellowship with God.
We now get to enjoy the ever-present presence of God because he himself said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So Saul in here, Saul got desperate that he turned back to mediums, the very ones he put out from the land. We read in Samuel 28, um, verse 7 to 8, it says, Then Saul said to his servants, Find me a woman who is a medium that I may go to her and inquire of her. I mean, oh no, Saul turned to his own vomit again. He had already put out the mediums and spiritists, right? But now he's turning back to them. And his servant said to him, In fact, there is a woman who is a medium at Endor. So Saul disguised himself and put on other clothes, and he went and two men with him, and they came to the woman by night. And he said, Please conduct a seance for me and bring up for me the one I shall name to you. In other words, Saul is asking to bring up the dead so he can speak with the dead. See, it doesn't matter if this was the prophet Samuel, dead is dead. Saul would have done well to leave the dead alone and turn to God, put on sackcloths and put ashes on his head as what is instituted in the Old Testament. Instead, Saul turned to mediums and spiritists. And you all know the story. Even before the woman who's a medium could conduct a seance, the prophet Sam Samuel came up and guess what Samuel pronounced again to Saul? The very same words he had spoken to Saul long before he died. The words he spoke to Saul in, Sam, in 1 Samuel 15, which is that the kingdom will be torn away from Saul. But listen to this. Samuel added these words in uh, uh, verse 19 in the same chapter. Moreover, the Lord will also deliver Israel with you into the hand of the Philistines. And tomorrow you and your sons will be with me. The Lord will also deliver the army of Israel into the hand of the Philistines. Now listen, friends. When something is dead, leave it dead. Because if you notice, there are three proclamation of dooms in differing levels and areas here. Now let me break them out so it's easier for all of us. The first one is the loss of land. And then we have the next, which is the loss of life. And then the last one, the loss of people. Friends, digging up what is dead and letting what has been put away speak to you and guide you leads to destruction. It leads to death. Dealing with mediums and familiar spirits mean dealing with the dead and what has been put away and done away with. Familiar spirits are spirits that only pronounce death and give words from the mouth of the dead. Isaiah 8.19 puts it this way. It says, And when they say to you, seek those who are mediums and wizards who whisper and mutter, should not a people seek their God? Should they seek the dead on behalf of the living? In other words, seeking mediums and wizards is not only about going to an actual person who call up the dead for you. It is also seeking that which has died, digging up what has been dead and buried, seeking the dead instead of the living. Now, do you know that 2,000 years ago, your old self, your identity of being a sinner was born in the body of our Lord Jesus. And as Jesus died on that cross, so did your old identity. Friends, do you realize that your old self had died? You were once a sinner, but now you are the saved. You are the righteous justified by the sacrifice of Jesus. You are the redeemed. You will do well not to let your old self overshadow your new glorious identity in Christ Jesus. You are not a sinner saved by grace. You were a sinner, but now you are the saved by grace. Saying you are a sinner saved by grace is just like saying I am man and woman. Look, you're either a sinner or you're the saved. Know who you are. So keep this in mind. Just like the old prophet Samuel, your old self had died and had been buried in the death and burial of Jesus. And boy, oh boy, in the resurrection of Jesus, you were born again. Your old self was not resurrected. Your old self is left in the grave. You, my dear friends, are a new creation. Old things have passed away. The new has come. It, it says in 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, and you are in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. See, you are not your old self. You are new. You are no longer the sinner you once were. That self had died on that cross. Because you are in Christ, you are a new creation. You may look the same. You may feel the same. You may sound the same. You may even look like you are demon possessed. <laughs> But in the spirit, you're a brand new spirit. When I wake up in the morning and my hair is all over the place, I look in the mirror and get scared, thinking I'm seeing someone demon-possessed, and then realize it was just me, a born-again child of God. So like I said, your old sinner self 
is as dead as the prophet Samuel. Leave the dead alone. Dead is dead. Do not deal with familiar spirits. Familiar spirits are unclean spirits that resurrect your old dead self. Now, do you know what the New Testament equivalent of familiar spirits are? In the New Testament, they are called with one name, the accuser of the brethren. The accuser of the brethren means the enemy does not accuse those who are not born again in the spirit. He only comes at us who are born in the spirit and accuses us. That's why it says the accuser of the brethren. Do you know how to defeat and silence his accuses? By the blood of the lamb and by the word of our testimony. Whenever the enemy comes at you and points you to yourself and calls you in your former identity, whenever the enemy comes at you with accusations pointing you to your sins and shortcomings, don't fight the enemy. Don't even try to prove yourself. I'm sure all of us still stumble here and there, even after being born again. But what should we do? We simply turn to the Father and say, Thank you, Father, that even if all those are true, that I did this and that because of the blood of Jesus shed for me, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That's your word of testimony, testifying of what Jesus has done for you. All right? I need all born-again children of God to listen. Accusing you of sin and convicting you of sin is not the work of the Holy Spirit. I repeat, accusing you of sin Pointing you to your old self, pointing you to your sins, and convicting you of sin is not the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, I can just feel in the Spirit some naysayers who would say, but Reva, Jesus himself said the Holy Spirit will convict us of sin. So, let's talk about the Holy Spirit and what Jesus actually said, because the words of Jesus had been taken out of context. John 16, uh, verse 8. These are the words of Jesus about the Holy Spirit. And we'll, uh, and that's going to be up until verse 11. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Jesus talking about the Holy Spirit here. Now, some of you probably are going, there you go, there you go. The Holy Spirit will convict us of sin. Now, friends, let's keep reading because Jesus is not done talking. Notice the colon. Jesus goes on to specify the convictions. Jesus says, of sin, because they do not believe in me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. To put these things into context, let us remember that these words were spoken by Jesus in the upper room on the night before he died on the cross. And in the upper room, only disciples were present. Judas, who betrayed him, was already out at this point. Also, let's understand that in this world, there are those who do not believe in Jesus. They, Jesus says, are the ones the Holy Spirit will convict of sin. Then there are those who do believe in Jesus, like the disciples, like you and me today who believe in Jesus. Us, Jesus says, are the ones the Holy Spirit will convict of what? Of righteousness. Why? Because Jesus goes to the Father. Meaning, Jesus cannot physically remind us that we have been made righteous by His blood and His sacrifice, but the Holy Spirit, His Holy Spirit, will convict us of righteousness whenever we stumble and whenever the enemy comes accusing us. And then in this world, we also know that Satan and his gang are present. He is called the ruler of the world, who had already been judged at the cross. It is He, Jesus says, that the Holy Spirit will convict of judgment. Are you all seeing it? When we don't understand the ministry of the Holy Spirit in our lives or as born-again children of God, we will accept condemnation and judgment which are not supposed to be ours. And did you all notice that the Holy Spirit only convicts those who do not believe Jesus of one sin? It does not say sins. It says sin. It is singular. So what sin does the Holy Spirit convict them of? The sin of not believing in Jesus. Now I understand a lot of us is, uh, a lot of us have grown up sitting under sermons and messages that tells us the Holy Spirit will convict us as born again believers of sins but look at scripture for yourselves look at your own bibles read your own bibles read the scriptures see for yourself the error in what we have been told about the Holy Spirit I've said this in several previous teachings and I'll say it again. Do not believe everything you hear. Even my teachings. Do not believe it until you have proven it through scripture. It is to your benefit and the benefit of your soul that you check everything you hear against scripture. 
It is time to stop. I mean, it's it's time we stop having this wrong image of the Holy Spirit in our heads. The Holy Spirit is one and the same in character as Jesus is, who is also the express image of the Father. The triune God is consistent in their nature and character. It is not that God is the bad guy who keeps on punishing people and Jesus is the good guy who died for us and the Holy Spirit is a police who keeps on pointing us to our mistakes. That is an erroneous image of the triune God. They are not working against each other. All three had been from the beginning working on getting humanity redeemed. Each had their roles to play, but none of their roles was against humanity. It was all for humanity. But of course, before Jesus died, sinful actions had to be punished because that is what being just and righteous is. And our God is holy, just, and righteous. So you see the punishments on sins in the Old Testament. But that is not all God is. Sin is sin, and sin had to be punished. But let's not forget the Father himself sent his Son, his own Son, so that once and for all the entire sins of the entire humanity can be punished at the cross in the body of our Lord Jesus Christ instead of ours, instead of yours and mine. And, you know, while the whole world will never understand the depth of what happened on that cross when the Son of God, Jesus, bore all our sins and sicknesses and curses and diseases on his body and took upon himself the punishment that was meant for you and me, the devil saw it. But more importantly, the Holy Spirit saw it. Both hell and heaven were witnesses of how the Son of God bore all our punishment on that cross so that the holiness of the law is fully accomplished and that the holiness of God, the justice of God, the righteousness of God are satisfied. And as Jesus cried out, it is finished, our victory was won over death. We have been made free so that today you and I need not be afraid of death and of hell and we can say, oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, Hades. Where is your victory? Today, my dear friends, when the enemy comes at you, when familiar spirits who are revealed in the New Testament to be the accuser of the brethren come to you and accuse you and point you to your sins, hear the Holy Spirit who dwells in you. Hear the Holy Spirit say, you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And agree with the Holy Spirit and confess the same because he is the spirit of truth. When familiar spirits, the accuser of the brethren, come to you and accuse you and point you to your sins and make you feel dirty and useless and make you feel like God is angry at you, hear the Holy Spirit who dwells in you, hear him say, I am a true witness to what Jesus did on that cross for you. Hear the Holy Spirit who dwells in you, hear him say, God has made a covenant with you, an eternal covenant cut by the blood of Jesus. Hear the Holy Spirit who dwells in you. Hear him say, your sins and your lawless deeds, God remembers no more. Friends, Jesus himself says of the Holy Spirit, he will glorify me for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. You know what is of Jesus? The righteousness of God. And that righteousness, the Holy Spirit takes and declares it to you. None of us have any righteousnesses on our own. The book of Isaiah says, all our righteousnesses are filthy rags. None of us can boast. None of what we do or will do or can do can make us righteous. None. Only the blood and the sacrifice of Jesus can make one righteous. And if you have received Jesus, you are his. You are in Jesus. And the Holy Spirit now sees you, the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, and the Holy Spirit will declare it to you. Friends, the spirit or spirits that come from the enemy, the accuser of the brethren, function as familiar spirits. They dig up your old self that has died and was buried. Those spirits are not from God. Do not listen to these unclean spirits. Do not listen to the words of these familiar spirits. They are not from God. The only thing they are familiar with is sins and shortcomings. Listen to the Holy Spirit of whom Jesus calls the Paracletos, the Comforter. In the Gospel of John, we find Jesus calling the Holy Spirit the Comforter four times. The Greek word Paracletos only appears five times in the Bible, five being the number of grace in Bible numerics. And as I have shown you, uh, four times it appears in the Gospel of John. The fifth and last time the Greek word parakletos appears in the Bible is in the epistle of the same apostle, in the first epistle of John. But this time, it is no longer used to point to the Holy Spirit as a comforter. 1 John uh, chapter 2, verse 1, My little children, these things are right to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins... 
And how many of us, even after being born again, still stumble here and there? All, uh, all of us, right? I, I don't care how long you have been born again. All of us are still given to the stirrings of our flesh, like anger, fear, lust, all of us, no exceptions. But it says in here, if any one of us sins, we have an advocate. And the word advocate in here is the Greek word parakletos. The same Greek word used to point to the Holy Spirit as comforter is now used to mean advocate. Advocate with the Father, who? Jesus Christ, the righteous. In other words, just as the Holy Spirit functions as your comforter, meaning whenever the accuser of the brethren or familiar spirits dig up your old self that died in Jesus on the cross and points you back to your old identity, the Holy Spirit pleads your case and points you back to the work of Jesus on that cross that has made you who you now are, a child of God. The Holy Spirit reminds you of that. And at the same time, Jesus at the right hand, of the Father, who is judge of all, Jesus functions as your advocate, pleading your case to the Father, saying, yes, this child is do has done so and so, but what this child of yours did just now has been condemned 2,000 years ago in my body when I hung on that cross. Jesus says, Father, I pay the price for this child to be judged not guilty in the courts of heaven today because I was punished for that sin. This child is still the righteousness because it is still the righteousness of God because she is in me father friends most of you don't know who i am apart from me being your weekly teacher most of you don't know what i've done before i was saved three years ago but there is one today present in this world who have seen all that i've done heard all that i have said knows all about me and who is very active in my life and i can tell you this he is not who i have been taught to believe with everything that the Holy Spirit knows about me, he does not come to me pointing me to me. And I don't find in New Covenant Scripture that the Holy Spirit is an accusing voice of the children of God. He is not who we have been taught to believe. He does not come accusing us. He does not come convicting us of sin. He does not come shaming us or making us feel guilty. He comes to us as a comforter, an advocate, much like who Jesus is, because he is the one. He is one and the same with Jesus, the righteous and the Father. One of the many characters in the Bible that I truly relate to is the adulteress, of whom the Pharisees dragged Jesus and told Jesus that she was caught in the act of adultery. And you know the story, how Jesus said, He who is without sin, let him throw the first stone at her. And one by one, they all left. See, none of us is without sin. None, none, none of them can throw a stone at the woman. But there was one in there who is without sin, who alone has all the right to condemn and throw the first stone at her. But he did not. His name is Jesus, the righteous, the only righteous man who ever lived. But even with the adulteress, he never picked a stone to throw at her. Instead, he spoke to her the kindest word there is ever spoken to a sinner. John 8, verse 10 to 11, and I'll close with this. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Friends, this is your Jesus. Most of us live our Christian lives as if Jesus is asking us to get our acts together before he can say he does not condemn us. But that's not what he said. That's not his heart. He first gave the woman the gift of no condemnation before he sends her empowered to sin no more. Much like this adulteress, the gift of condemnation empowers us today to sin no more. If Jesus was gracious to this woman even before he died for her on that cross to pay the penalty of her adultery, what makes any of us today think Jesus will be less gracious to any of us of whom he had already died for and are now called children of God because of his sacrifice? This same nature and character in Jesus is the same nature and character of the Holy Spirit who today lives in you and me. Friends, like I said at the start, the Holy Spirit is in us for us. He is in you to convict you of righteousness now that Jesus has gone to the Father and we see Jesus no more visibly. The Holy Spirit is the most active person of the triune God. He is here today, not to condemn you, not to accuse you, but to point you to the finished work of Jesus and the perfect work that Jesus has done in you through his sacrifice on that cross 2,000 years ago. What a God we have. We have a truly wonderful God. He made it all possible for us to have this kind of relationship with him through our Lord Jesus Christ. 
The voice of the accuser of the brethren is all around us. We, we even hear it from people around us. But do not listen to it. Listen to the Holy Spirit instead, who is your comforter here on earth and your advocate in the courts of heaven. Amen. Some of you listening right now are in a place where you feel like you, what you have done have made you unreachable by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Friend, I'm here to announce to you that nothing, nothing that any of us can do can void the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hear him say to you today, I do not condemn you. Will you receive my comfort? Will you trust me that I am your advocate? And if there is someone watching who have not made this wonderful Jesus your Lord and Savior, friend, he only waits to be received. Receiving Jesus is the singular most important decision you can, you can ever make in your life that has eternal consequences. Will you receive Jesus by praying this with me? Just say, Jesus, I believe in you. I believe in what you have done for me on that cross. I believe you died for me on that cross. I believe that my old sinner identity died with you on that cross and that in your burial, my old self was buried too. I believe that in your resurrection, you have declared me righteous. I believe in you, Jesus. Save me. Amen. Friend, if you have prayed that prayer, believing in Jesus, we believe that you have just been born again into the kingdom of God, who is now your Father. Welcome home. Friends, let's close in prayer. Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for your son who paid the price we can never pay to be reconciled back to you. Thank you for providing yourself a perfect lamb in Jesus to atone for all our sins and to make us your beloved children. Thank you that it was your love and grace that sent your son to die for all of us. Lord Jesus, thank you that you came. Thank you for shedding your blood and for your death on that cross for all of us. Thank you that you have given us your Holy Spirit to dwell in us for us and to be on us and fill us for others and your purpose. Thank you that you are our advocate. Thank you that it is your righteousness that makes us holy, righteous, and blameless in the courts of heaven. Thank you for your blood, Jesus. Holy Spirit, water the word of God that had been sown into our hearts today. Continue to reveal to us the nature and character of our God in the person of the Father, the Son, and you, Holy Spirit. Continue to grow us in the knowledge and grace of our Lord Jesus. Teach us more about Jesus. Open scripture to us. Reveal to us the heart of our God in the glories and excellencies of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Friends, the Lord bless you and keep you, you and your loved ones. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his shalom, peace, and well-being. Amen, amen, amen. Friends, the Holy Spirit is a person and he lives in you permanently. The Holy Spirit is the most important person in your life. May we all get to know him because the Holy Spirit is one and the same with Jesus. He is for you and never against you. God bless you all. Take care and shalom.